All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to Best Story Wins, a column five podcast where we have in-depth conversations with some of the best and brightest from the world of content marketing. In these conversations, we talk about building brands, how to win a customer heart and mind, and where our guests see the industry going. I'm your host, Josh Ritchie, and I'm here with my co-host and co-founder at Column 5, Jason Lenko. And today our guest is Brian Saffler, a director of product marketing at Databricks, one of the most exciting growth stage companies that I even know of. Hey, Brian, thanks for joining us today. How's it going? Hey, guys. It's going hey, really well. Nice to see you guys again. It's awesome, been far yeah. too long. Great yeah, to see you. It's been a while, huh? Um, so, Brian, director of product marketing at Databricks. Uh, what does that mean and what do you do? Well, I think this is quite an apt uh, title for your show, but it's all about storytelling. My job is to effectively lower the cognitive barrier for people looking to buy database products and help make sure that they understand how to build a database business. Awesome. And yeah. I think a lot of people have heard of Databricks. It's also one of those companies where it's maybe not the easiest to wrap your head around if you're sort of a lay person, if you will. So um, would you just, for, for people at home, would you unpack what Databricks is and what you all do? And then um, if you could also share a little bit about what you think is super interesting about the company, that would be awesome too, just as a primer. Sure. Um, Databricks is a, a data platform for analytics, AI, and machine learning. It was founded in 2013. A um, simple way to think of it is it was started by a bunch of college professors at Berkeley. And they looked at the world of data, big data, as it was kind of like growing up. And they're starting to see just a whole bunch of trends that were kind of coming across. You know, back in the 1980s, you got these data warehouses. And in the 2010s, you got this data lake that kind of pops up. And each one's kind of an iterative, you know, solution on top of the next. And what they came up with was this idea of this thing called the data lake house. And it was kind of this thesis to this concept of like, how do we improve upon the model and help people really take full advantage of all the data at any frequency in any structure and really use that to the advantage of their business. And, uh, you know, fast forward eight years, we are now, you know, founders of the lake house platform. You know, we have this great product that goes across these three amazing clouds of Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And effectively what we're doing is we're helping unify all the data within any business and any vertical in any industry to really take full advantage of understanding what's going on in their, their product, understand their customers, help them find and engage new customers and ultimately help them activate and, and monetize those customers over time. And you can't do that if you have a fragmented user base or no access to real-time data or the inability for your, your data to keep up with your legacy technologies. So really what Databricks is about is just about simplifying all of the structure, helping empower teams using data so that they can build better products and deliver more value to their customers. So that's that's a little bit of what it is. Um, my whole history of like, I've always been in product marketing. I've been around for a really, really long time. I worked at Microsoft for almost 15 years. Uh, I got stolen away to Databricks, mostly because in the last five years of being at Microsoft, I started to see all of my customers. I was in the gaming space. I started to see a lot of my customers using Databricks as a way to really help them not only build better games, but to help grow those games, particularly in live service titles, which are games built in cycles of constant iteration. And basically, once you ship the game, uh, the operation of that game is is just as important as the development of the game itself. Mm -hmm. So I saw these titles being, you know, moved on to Databricks and using Databricks to like help build and grow their games. And the more I just dug into the the product truth, the more I was just entranced by like, this really is like the best solution that's out there. And as I started talking to the team and, and hearing more and more about their story, they actually had a marketer's dream of a problem. They had an incredible mm. product truth and just not enough people knew about it. And as you guys know, if anybody's like a storyteller or a marketer out there, like that's the one you want to go for because oftentimes marketers are like hamstrung into selling uh, things that we might not fully believe in. Um, <laughs> but half the time, uh, you know, you, you end up finding a way to make it work. Well, in the rare case that you find a product or a space in a place in which the product truth is incredible and just not enough people know about it, like that's when like marketing really can come to life because you just have so much more potential on your palate of like how to go tell a story and how to get people engaged. Yeah, that's so nice. interesting. Yeah, we have, we have, you know, obviously sales conversations with folks all the time and I can kind of gather pretty early on what kind of problem someone has. Like, is it a... Is it a product that 
they're not able to communicate about effectively or is it some really decent marketing and then underneath that there's something that doesn't really work so i always prefer to talk to people that have the former problem going on because yeah as you said as a marketer um all you gotta do is figure out how to tell that story and, and tell that story right. well tell it consistently um so that's really cool to hear I, I wasn't really aware of that 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 um that premise in terms of where you started and what your focus is um obviously we go way back um and have worked together through the years um one of my questions for you um i know we've we've talked about marketing for for years and years and years but one question i've always been curious about you know for you is how did you how did you know marketing content marketing brand building was where you wanted to focus in your career hmm. i i think like a lot of people i i didn't set out going in that direction i think with a lot of times your career is a is a an amalgamation of all the decisions you've made and mm -hmm. in a lot of ways i landed here mostly because it is ticking more boxes than other things i started mm -hmm. in in on the product side actually in engineering as a program manager when i first started in the world of big tech i worked in microsoft i was a program manager for windows live my job, my first job out of out of college and really working in, in, in Microsoft was to assist the out of box experience to make that even better for Windows Live Essentials. And that was a competing product to the Apple iLife suite, if you guys remember that, like they had photo gallery and movie maker. And within Windows Live Essentials was also MSN Messenger at the time, which was like the flagship product. Um, and, and my job was to help you know, reduce the pain of installing that that plat that product on the platform because at the time we were still working through the consent decree of Microsoft, so we couldn't bundle Windows Live Essentials into uh, Windows as like something that came like hand in hand. You had to actually download it after the fact. And it was this it was this whole thing, but it, it taught me a lot about product development. Um, it taught me a lot about like the the roadmap, understanding customers, really gathering customer feedback and insight, bringing that into the engineering roadmap and defining feature prioritization. And I think the thing that came out of it for me was like during that whole process and working with the marketing teams, the value proposition, the positioning, the messaging was core to why you create a feature set or why you build a product in the first place. And what's really neat and this is, you know, Microsoft does this. I think a lot of other companies do this similarly as well, is there's just this incredible partnership between the engineering and marketing and business teams to really understand and define who is it that you're building a product for? Why are you building that product in the first place? And then how do you then go construct something that adds value? And what I started to realize was I really gravitated to the parts of the job where I was writing like copy, talking about customers, listening to feedback. And traditionally, that's something that handles, you know, more on the marketing side of the house than necessarily on the engineering side of the house. Not, not to say that there's not overlap, but um, at least at Microsoft, that's kind of how the thing shook out. And so as I was progressing in my career, I just kind of like rotated and gravitated towards more of those roles where I had a chance to practice that skill set. And mm. I love stories. I think storytelling is innately human. And it's just something that, you know, I personally wake up every day, get excited about telling stories. And so when I was looking for jobs and I was trying to define like what I wanted my career to be, uh, the piece, the scarlet thread that I think kind of like runs all the way through is this idea that I, I want to be a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of defined the things that I go do and the jobs that I take based off of that insight. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. I, have, I have a quick follow-up on that because I think you touched on the the flywheel there between sale, sales, marketing, and engineering. What do you what do you see as the ideal balance there, right? Because it's sometimes kind of a notorious battle between, you know, sales promises and what engineering can deliver or what they already have on their product roadmap. Uh, but it kind of works the other way with marketing too, right? Like sales saying we need more of this to enable this type of sale. What when when you're what's your mindset when you're working in marketing and you get these requests from the sales team, do you feel like it's like we're marching towards our beat and brand is driving like our mission, so to speak, or is it like ultimately we're trying to drive sales here and, or how do you balance those competing interests sometimes? I, I think that's a really important question that is hyper dependent upon the culture of the team and the type of product that you're building, the industry that you're in. 
what I'm doing right now at Databricks is actually a really great example of this. And I think it's partly because we're an amalgamation of many cultures. There's people from Microsoft and, and Google and Amazon, as well as tons of other startups like Salesforce and Okta and you name it. We're like, there were just so many people kind of thrown together. And so there's just a bunch of best practices that kind of Adam smashed into like, you know, we're picking the best of the best. And how I see that flow kind of working as a flywheel is like, you need everybody's voice at the table. Your, sale, your sellers are going to be really, really close to your customers. And in fact, they're probably closer, especially in a B2B business than anybody else because they're talking to the customers on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're going to hear right. the pain points and the, the challenges and the reasons why they like a competitive product versus your product. Mm -hmm. Similarly, your engineering team is going to understand the, the limitations and the opportunities available based off of the existing tech stack. Like, in a perfect world, of course, you'd architect it in a certain way, but then over time as you learn more about the needs of customers and the changing landscape and competitive environment and just people's propensity to buy things, you start to realize that you have to build and make certain tech decisions that help you in certain areas and hurt you in other areas. Mm -hmm. But that's part of what it means to be in engineering. And you assume a level of tech debt with the understanding that the value you're adding is more than the, the negative that that's detracting from. And then mm -hmm. marketing, you know, they connect a lot of the dots. If I if I go to my engineering team, they're really great at talking about the speeds and the feeds, but they really struggle at times to up-level it about the value and the customer opportunity that this provides. So having somebody that can translate those speeds and feeds into a story or action that makes sense to the, you know, the C-level executive who's getting these board directives to like do a massive digital transformation or, you know, define the next generation of customer experience, yeah. like being able to kind of connect those dots is mission critical. And so you, what you end up having is you have this like kind of a leadership team where there's these voices from every line of the business coming together and having a really robust debate and discussion about how to lean in, how to lead, what leads, what, like, where's their gap in the product truth? How do we define more and, and, more importantly, like how do we prioritize new features to address a need? And what I've seen work really, really well is when you have teams that recognize that give and pull. Oftentimes, if you have a team who's like either selling beyond their, you know, selling, you know, putting the cart before the horse or like pushing beyond their skis, uh, you make promises and you under deliver like, and you just, you burn customer credibility or vice versa. If you have a uh, an engineering team that's just so set on their product roadmap and not considering the needs of the customer. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding as well that you just end up missing out on opportunities. Like look how quickly, for example, generative AI has come onto the landscape. It's not new. Right. It's been around for a while, but in the, like in the, you know, the zeitgeist of conversation online, it is, it's like, it just showed up overnight. And once you could put Gary Busey on a turtle or <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, I laugh a little bit only in the fact of like, you need to be able to create an infrastructure that allows for that adaptation in near real time. And the more that you are able to adapt within the confines of the, the sandbox you have defined for your business, the more effective you will be, because it's not about swinging wildly from one side to the other as, you know, the consumer and, and, you know, business landscape changes, but it's about saying, how can we take advantage of what is right now in the conversation mm -hmm. so that we can naturally ride the, the waves rather than being, you know, kind of bunting into like brick walls every five seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Awesome yeah, answer. Super, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's super interesting. Um, so the, the name of this show is best story wins and, um, you know, obviously the term storytelling has been used or misused or overused pick your poison in our space for the last decade or so. Um, I think part of the confusion just is based on the fact that different people have different understandings of what that term means and they maybe use the term in, in, in very different ways. So um, Brian, I'd love to hear from you. Like what, what do you think storytelling is in the context of content marketing and what do you think it isn't? I define storytelling ultimately about the connection mm -hmm. between the need of a customer and the opportunity that you're providing in your product, tool, or service. 
storytelling is the way that like knowledge and understanding have been passed down for mm -hmm. generations. We're talking about like long before the invention of invent invention of written language. Storytelling is like what it means to be human. Like that's how we passed on knowledge. And so I think it's it's hardwired in us mm -hmm. that the best stories are ones that share our values and beliefs and do th so through a narrative. And these mm -hmm. stories are powerful. They inspire. And ultimately, the brands and companies that can craft stories, not just messages, but stories for their customers, it allows the customer to see themselves mm -hmm. in your brand. Mm -hmm. And I think in doing that, it endears them to your product, tool, or service. It helps them become advocates for your product, tool, or service, and it makes them feel like they're part of the larger story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So when you think about Databricks, and I know that there's there's still some work to be done, and um, one of the reasons why you were drawn to Databricks was because there was a big storytelling opportunity. Um, could you speak a little bit about how you see the the Databricks story? Uh, and how you, how, can you share a little bit about how you'd explain it right now? I know it might not be fully fleshed out, but, um, how would you, you know, paraphrase it, summarize it. And also as a, as a follow-up to that, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing, uh, resonating with the people you're trying to reach, uh, from that story? Are there certain elements? Are there certain solutions you're putting forth certain benefits? Um, would love to hear how you guys are thinking about this and approaching this opportunity. So let, let's try to connect those two thoughts. So like mm -hmm. if storytelling is about connection, Databricks, in order to be successful, needs to help people understand how data ultimately helps them drive their business. So mm -hmm. like that's kind of like the parallel path. Um, storytelling at Databricks is challenging because the company was born out of this practitioner mindset. I mentioned speeds and feeds before. Like this is where you know people will talk at nauseum about how fast it is on their, you know, ETL pipeline and, you know, the type of language that they're using in order to translate these, you know, data docs into these data docs. And it's just like, it is insane how in the weeds they can get and at that moment think that they're telling a story. Mm -hmm. And part of what I've noticed is like, even to a practitioner, someone who speaks the speeds and feeds, Telling a story to them on the value it provides isn't going to hurt, whereas mm -hmm. telling speeds and feeds to a C-level executive is just be literally going to make their eyes glaze over. Mm -hmm. So part of what the challenge is at Databricks right now is we've been so good at building a fantastic product for data practitioners, the data scientists, the data engineers, the data analysts of the world. Mm -hmm. Now what we have to do is we have to help the business decision makers, the directors, mm -hmm. the VPs, the C-level executives understand – how a data-driven organization helps them achieve their goals, and more importantly, how the Databricks platform is the means to an end on that. Mm. And that's where you know we talk about the power of our Lakehouse platform. It's the technology that we help pioneer. Effectively, it's an architecture that takes you know two and three decade old technologies, and it makes it work for you harder today. And the the short story, I'll, I'll just give you 20 seconds on what that mm -hmm. means because this is like super important to understand what Databricks is. But basically there, there's like two fundamental types of data storage. There's data warehousing, which was made in the 1980s, and there's the data lake, which was made in the 2010s. And effectively the data warehouse was first started as a way to kind of compile and structure data together. And it was it's really focused on structured data. Mm -hmm. You have to know the questions that you're going into before you put the data in there, because if you ask other questions than how the data the, how the data is structured, you can't really get it out. You have to kind of make, you know, a new structure, a format of data. It does a data warehouse does not take any unstructured data. So think about images, video, audio files. Those are unstructured data. It cannot it cannot adapt to that. And so as in the early 2010s, early 20, 2000s, we started to see these new formats of data really come to life and, and teams were starting to get inundated with this. We needed a new way of storing this data, enter the data lake. Mm -hmm. And a data lake is different from a data warehouse in that it can adapt, it can um, take on any type of data, at any frequency, unstructured data, semi-structured data, um, speed data, like batch data, uh, streaming data, can take it all. The problem is once you put the data in, getting it out is complicated. And I kind of uh, have an analogy here. It's like if you were to take a bunch of salt, like in a like a container, and you were going to dump it into a lake, 
Mm -hmm. super easy to get the salt into the lake. Yeah. Now get the salt back out of the lake with no additional additives. Mm. That is akin to putting data in a data lake and trying to get that data back out without it being obfuscated. Mm. And so there's two problems. You have you have one uh you have one data storage format which is data warehousing, super easy to read, easy to put data into, but it's limited in the type of data that you can get. You have this other format, which is super easy to get data into any type of data, but it's nearly impossible to get it out unless you have a PhD. How do you solve for this? Mm -hmm. And that's where Databricks and the founders kind of came up with this paradigm called the lake house, which takes a data lake as its base and it applies a data warehouse like structure atop it to create this thing called a lake house. It's the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. You can put any data at any frequency in there and you can freaking read it. That's the part that blows people's minds. It's cheaper, it's faster, and it's just better. Mm. Fundamentally, it's just better than any other type of where of, of storage. And it works on all three clouds. And it is we, we have some of the biggest brands in the world using Databricks in this architecture from Disney to – I'm just speaking specifically for media and entertainment because it's the world I live in mm – -hmm. to Activision to Mo Yang with Minecraft to – Crafton, PUBG, like just some of the biggest names in media and entertainment are using this. And it's it's amazing to see what they can do when they have access to this level of data. So I, I say all that to say this is like kind of like a, a run up to part of my job is to take that like five minute spiel of what I just gave you and narrow that to 30 seconds. And God, I haven't gotten there yet. But when I do, it's going to be incredible because like when you understand the context Mm -hmm. And you see what it is that we're offering. Mm -hmm. It's a no brainer. The mm -hmm. problem is synthesizing that into a 30 second elevator pitch that anybody can understand and that anybody can then immediately see their business in. That's hard. And that's, yeah, I think you're getting somewhere with the, the salt metaphor. Yeah. You know, yeah. definitely using some, I was, I was imagining this house that just, you know, pisses people off because it's covering the whole entire lake but maybe maybe that's not what you're going for but the <laughs> um I, it's, it's interesting like I, i've definitely sat in rooms with you know highly technical products where like you mentioned the board directive to for digital transformation and so on like a lot of these conversations have been around for a decade right and it's still challenging to basically figure out in I'd imagine for you in marketing, right? You're you're having to not be overly technical and alienate the general business user. But then if you're dumbing it down too much, then you're not going to have the credibility with, you know, the engineering team or analytics team that you're selling into. Uh, so when you think about like distilling, I know you mentioned you aren't there just yet, but even drawing from past experience, when you think about, the secret sauce or, or when you know you're actually there, like, do you think it's more, more along the lines of finding something that appeals and resonates across all of those audiences? Or do you think it's maybe somewhere in, in the realm of making a hard decision about who you're going to talk to, you know, even at the expense of alienating one other influencer in the buying decision? Oh, I, I think it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. In a lot of ways, I, I strongly believe that that type of a story, yielding a vehicle that allows you to speak at the 100,000-foot altitude, at the 50,000-foot altitude, and at the 10,000-foot altitude is completely a applicable. And it's our job as marketers, as storytellers, to craft that type of framework and foundation because that's what makes it really palpable. Like. If you think about some of the best storytellers, you know, brands out there, whether it's like the Nikes or the Apples of the world or smaller companies like Airbnb or even like Liquid Death or Dove, they have the ability to find the, the highest order story and then draw a scarlet thread all the way down to the individual use case and back up. And I think for Databricks that exists, like, right, like, at the end of the day, our, our meta level story is like, you know, content is king, but data is how you differentiate. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're trying to help people understand is like, you're in a commodity business. The only thing that's different between you and your competitors is the data that you have and how you utilize it. And if we start talking at 
that altitude, that's going to speak to your C-level executive. And then you kind of dig into saying, what are the big challenges you're facing today? Is it personalization? Is it real-time ad buying? Is it like you know, churn? Is, like, is that where you're you know, struggling? And then we can start to kind of get into now in speeds and feeds. Like here's why a lake house is better at churn mitigation and reduction than a standard warehouse or why using Databricks as a lake house on Google or on Amazon or on, on Microsoft makes sense for your business. Like you can kind of dig into it, but you're starting at the altitude or layer in which a, it's going to capture their attention straight away because it matters to them. And B, because you're able to identify the pain points that some of these teams are, are feeling. Right. So it's about, it's about finding that foundational story that you can then drill into and, and segment out. Yeah. In a lot of ways, it's, it's really listening. Uh, that one of the things that I've learned the most in working in B2B versus B2C is that B2B businesses really force you to listen to your customers. Mm -hmm. You could say the same is true of B2C, but because you're doing it such mass scale, it's like one to few, one to many in B2C, whereas in B2B, it's often one to one, even one to few. You're going to hear that qualitative feedback more you know, strongly, and they're going to tell you exactly why XYZ works or what they're looking for is XYZ pain. And I think in a lot of ways, we can learn from that approach and apply it, whether we're a consumer business or a you know, B2B business, really understanding and hearing and like empathizing with the person across the table from you is going to allow you to adapt whatever narrative or story you have to their situation, which therefore kind of coming back to the top of the, this conversation, it's about connection. You want to bridge that connection. And if you can't establish that from the jump, they're not going to listen to you. And you, and you touched on, uh, you've touched on a lot of great things here, you know, listening and empathizing with your customers is huge. You also were talking about, you know, even your message to your customers about how data, you know, you're in a, maybe you're in a commoditized industry and how you use your data differentiates. Uh, when you, when you think about packaging, patch, packaging this up into a messaging system or a sequence series of stories. How how does that like how do you think about creating something that's like defensible? You know, because I feel like a lot of people in say the value proposition level, they there's a lot of gravity towards it it's, makes you money or saves you money. It's going to save you time. Like when you think about like those functional benefits, you know, like it at some level people are often saying the exact same thing. So how do you think about pulling together your own, you know, through your story, something that's defensible and that differentiates you from competition. I think those, those words defensible, differentiated are really critical mm. and they must be at the forefront of whatever value proposition, positioning or messaging that you're defining. When I think about storytelling with those as kind of my North star, I want to understand how do I create a value proposition that builds upon itself? Because defensible is literally like, think about like a wall, like to use the metaphor, like I hate to say it of like war, but like think about how, you know, societies ages ago would construct these mega walls surrounding their cities. The higher the wall, the more defensible the position, both inside and out was. And in a way, your value proposition, the more that you can build upon itself, the more it's self-reinforcing, the more defensible that position is. And differentiation and, and defensible positions come from things like ecosystem partnerships and alignment with, with partners in the, in the area or product truth and your ability to shift the narrative as the, the conversation and the culture changes. Like those are all pieces of what makes storytelling really powerful and the value proposition of, of your product tool or service more defensible. And again, defensible differentiation is just how you construct a story so that whether it's real or imagined, the work required by your competition to beat you is increased. Mm -hmm. If they're having to work harder to kind of shift their story in order to compete with you, you're creating more differentiated and defensible positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to backtrack a little Please. bit. You were talking earlier about um, getting qualitative feedback from the market on your story and how it's resonating with, with the folks you're trying to appeal to. How have you seen or heard from the folks that you're trying to reach, maybe the buyers, maybe the people that influence buyers, that you guys understand what they're up against and that the story you're telling is actually resonating? Yeah, man, you know, 
the the number one like piece of feedback is is whether or not someone is literally implementing the suggestions and recommendations you're putting together. Oftentimes mm-hmm. in a B2B business, you're selling in a solution or story and it really starts with those early adopters. Mm-hmm using the product, building on the product and, and, and working the, working the problem space. So it's like, Hey, I, you told me to go do this and architect it in such a way that either helped or hurt me. Mm-hmm. And if it hurt you really understanding how it hurt you, was it a process implementation? Was it the cost of the implementation? Is the total cost of ownership a problem? Was it how hard it was to understand and, and technically implement, or is it like your cust you did this thing and now your customers hate whatever you've done, like really getting to the bottom of what it is working and what's not working, especially with those early adopters is going to give you that early signal, which then as you start speaking to more and more teams, the number one selling thing, like it, if you take nothing away from what I'm saying in a B2B business, the most important thing you can have is customer stories. Because I could tell you six ways from Sunday how my product is better. The first thing someone's going to ask you is who's doing it. Yeah. And if you have right. really good customer stories, not just customer stories of like, hey, Disney's doing our, their thing on our stuff. But it's like, here's the problem Disney was running into. Here's what they looked at. Here's why they chose our platform. Here's the reasons that they picked our platform. Mm-hmm. Here's what it did, the impact as a result of implement, implementing this stuff and then you know six months 12 months later here's the impact of the business that business value case being super important part of the story Mm -hmm. all of a sudden that is that's the best selling vehicle you have period yeah yeah absolutely i mean we we see this playing out in a very similar way for our business right i mean if i tell someone at a conference or at a meetup or whatever like hey you should work with column five we're really good like that might that might get them intrigued, <laughs> right? To to maybe reach out or maybe have a conversation. But if you and I are there at that conference together and you're like, hey, this is my buddy Josh. He's one of the guys over at Column Five. They're the best. You should talk to them. That's gonna leave a different mark on them. And so right. um makes a ton of sense. So when it comes to storytelling, I know we've talked about storytelling quite a bit, and I think we've uh honed in on some folks that have, you know, done storytelling well historically. You mentioned Patagonia, I think, you mentioned Nike, Dove, Liquid Death. Liquid Death is probably my favorite water brand right now. Maybe one of my favorite brands right now. Um, on the flip side, and I don't want you to have to call out anybody, obviously, but um, so the question isn't like who's get who's getting brand storytelling wrong, but like what do you think people misunderstand when it comes to telling a good brand story? I that I mean that's a that's a really good question. I, most often, I I think people forget that the customer is the hero Mm -hmm. of the story, not the brand. And oftentimes whenever I'm, I'm talking with a team or I'm consulting, or I'm just like naturally curious looking at what people are doing, where I see people get hung up is when they start talking about themselves Mm -hmm. and they forget and they're in an echo chamber and they're like, we're so great. This is what's so great about our thing. And it's basically a a solution looking for a problem. Mm -hmm. The best stories, particularly brand stories, are the ones that we see ourselves in. Mm -hmm. And every single time I look at someone, I'm just like, man, that's so awesome. It's because I see myself in that that thing, Mm -hmm. whatever that is. And it could be like Athletic Greens or Liquid Death or Nike, or it could be like, I was like super sold on like Riverside, this platform we're using for uh, recording this podcast and how they sold it. It was like, they literally nailed the problem space that I was, I was struggling in and they made it like their, their big pitch to me was like, we take the editing out of it, right? Like we will mm-hmm. do all the work for you. You literally just, you record and we'll spit out a great asset. That's like almost ready to go. And it's true. Like it kills. And that, in and of itself was just, it was the right way to speak to me. And it's when people, like I mentioned before, it's like when they think about themselves as the hero, not the customer as the hero, that's where people get tripped up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it kind of goes back to that, that silly analogy I used to right about like talking about yourself versus letting someone else talk for you. Um, Yes. One of the things we talk about at Calm 5 a lot internally and in a lot of our conversations with our clients is this idea that, you know, all stories are content, but not all content are stories. And another way of thinking about it is, you know, 
the best stories are ones where you're not being sold, right? When you're trying to sell yeah. someone, you're basically not able to tell a story. You're just trying to sell them. So, um, and maybe you could say it's a sales story, but I, I think it, you kind of lose the plot at that point. Um, so it's cool to hear you, how you think about this. I think it's very aligned with how we think about it. And I think it's also very aligned, um, to how some of the best in the biz, uh, think about this as well. So it's really cool. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about kind of what's next. Um, obviously we're in a interesting moment right now. We, it seems like we just got through COVID and now it seems like the economy's, uh, going through a lot of upheaval. Everyone's talking about interest rates. Everyone's talking about the macroeconomic picture. Obviously our sector tech has been hit pretty hard recently with layoffs. Um, what is this shift in the macro picture uh, meaning for you all in terms of how you're shifting gears and how you're looking at what you're doing in the brand and marketing space um, at Databricks? I I think there's two ways to kind of answer this question. There's there's like, what are we doing as Databricks? And then mm-hmm. more broadly, like, what are people doing in marketing in general? Um, there's a lot happening from, you know, we talked about earlier, like the emergence of generative AI as a topic in general, mm-hmm. which is both interesting as a topic and then also has impact to how we do our jobs to the continued evolution of what it means to be a data-driven marketer. You can no longer just be a madman marketer who's got a gut feeling and throw something out there and see if it sticks. Like you actually have to bring data to the table. Mm-hmm. And more importantly, the people who use data are more effective at their jobs because you're, you know, more efficient, your costs, you know, for acquisitions, better, like whatever you want to name a business KPI, you probably are better at it. And then like, I also think there's an evolution in the role of, of the four C's, this communication, this collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, how are we, you know, finding the human element as part of our job that helps separate and differentiate us from what AI could theoretically do? Cause it's not to say that AI is bad. It's just, just going to change how we do our jobs and so from a you know the macroeconomic climate what i would say is like finding new ways to add value mm. should be the fundamental number one thing as marketers that we do and what does that mean for databricks it means that like i'm constantly looking for ways i can create new value for the organization whether it is identifying opportunities to participate in a different channel we may not be as familiar with like for example doing a twitch stream behind the scenes of what it means to be a data scientist, which appeals to a different audience just by the nature of who's watching Twitch. Um, or it could be that like we craft a different type of partner story with a partner that we haven't really worked with in the past, whether that's a consulting partner, a solution integrator, or an ISV. Um, so like being in that mindset of a marketer, constantly evolving, being okay with shifting and, and changing things, that's really what we need to look at. And especially as teams are making really difficult decisions. Like right now, there's just you know, the, there's just so much churn happening in the industry, especially in white collar jobs, which were traditionally very safe as a growth mm-hmm. you know, area of the market. The jobs and the individuals who can demonstrate the value add they bring to the business, mm-hmm. not to say are, are safer, but are going to be more safe. Mm-hmm. than roles that can easily be replaced because it's a, it's a remedial task. And mm-hmm. I look at like copywriting is a great example. Mm-hmm. There will always be copywriters, yeah. but there will never be, co- there will never always be copywriters as we know them today. Mm-hmm. Today, copywriters, you know, are writing copy because they understand English as a prose and the language and how to construct a story and all that kind of stuff. Tomorrow, Copywriters might be extremely good prompt people in chat right. GPT yeah. and they understand once something is, is put out how to then edit it and they become the best editors in the world. Like right. that doesn't take away the job. It just shifts the job. Yeah. Right. Every right. smart take, every smart take or seemingly smart take, obviously things will have to play out. Right. But every smart take I've heard on chat GPT is that copywriters jobs are not going away, but it's the copywriters who learn how to use chat GPT are going to be the ones that are just they're gonna be superhumans. Yeah. They're going to be insane. Right. In terms of what they get done. And, um, well, it's to like wild... use it as a structure, like a jumping off point mm-hmm. yeah. and add, you know, we were talking about like differentiating and not sounding like anyone else. There's already platforms, you know, kind of countering chat GPT to tell you like whether the copy was written by a human or not. So like, mm for at least some 
you know, whether they're Luddites or whatever, you know, some segment of the population is going to always appreciate the human touch, you know, or at least for the foreseeable future. So there's, I, it's interesting to think about how you can, you know, you could either become overly dependent on AI or you could figure out how to work alongside it, or you can just be, you know, scared to death of it. And obviously there's people in each camp, but it's interesting. You mentioned the like super prompter as maybe the mm-hmm. copywriter of the future, because it does take skills to, mm-hmm. it's a different oh, kind yeah. of skill, right? To like get a specific type of response, ask the right questions. And I see the future being output. It's about how these individuals are increasing their throughput and their output to levels that nobody's seen before. Everything is a factor of time, quality, and money. And if what you're doing is you're still paying the person the same, but you're getting more output from them and the quality of that output is higher, they've mm-hmm. added value. That's demonstrable value add to the business. And now a copywriter can justify a higher level of wage because they're giving more value to the business and they're doing it at a faster rate. And to them, it's not changing their work-life balance. They're just not, instead of having to write 10,000 words, they're editing 10,000 words because yeah. they prompted something perfectly and now they're starting to work from that. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Um, yeah, I, we could go into could like talk 20 to you different- for hours about that. Yeah, we could go into <laughs> like 20 different rabbit holes on, on that one. And maybe that's for the follow-up podcast um, episode. But yeah, so you guys are like every company, right? Having to figure out what this recession um, means for you all in terms of a marketing department. Um, How are you guys thinking about shifting priorities around? Are there certain things you're you're thinking, all right, let's cut completely. Are there certain things you're looking at and you're like, let's reduce. Are there certain things you're looking at and you're like, let's take this from being fifth on the list to now first. Like, how are you guys just approaching that? I, this, This is a great example of like where a data-driven marketer can help ensure the company doesn't make bad mistakes. The the worst thing that can happen in a company during times when they're just basically like wholesale cutting things is to cut the wrong thing. Maybe you need more brand awareness, but brand awareness is really hard and cagey to measure. And so you just cut it entirely. But then you ultimately end up hurting your down level business. Why are we not getting the throughput from top of funnel to mid funnel, mid funnel to bottom funnel? Well, it's like you're not putting enough people at the top of your funnel. Why is that? Because nobody knows you exist. Nobody's thinking about you. Nobody's considering you. Nobody has intent to use. And so a data driven marketer can approach the problem not from what do we need to cut in order to say, or what do we need to cut in order to save money? They look at it in terms of saying, what is the most important activities we can do in order to achieve the business goals? Yeah. And in doing that, they can then give a framework to the team more broadly to be able to say, these ROI generating activities Mm -hmm. are something that are just, they're foundational. We just need to do it and we need to invest in it. These secondary, still measurable, but more squishy metrics are are activities like events. Like we Mm -hmm. still need to participate in events because events are ways that we get in front of the right customers who are all congregated at the same place at the same time. And then there's going to be a set of big bets that we're going to take, like one, two, three rocks that was like, hey, you know what? We don't know exactly the measurement on this, but we have hypotheses that say that they're 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 helpful in pointing people towards what we're doing. Thought leadership, roundtables, panel discussions, uh, an event or a strategic partnership with somebody like those are things that are incredibly challenging to measure. But you there's like good thinking, good theory that the content that creates that you're creating that surrounds that activity, um, the thought leadership that you're putting out there, it's a leading indicator that drives people to what you're doing. And if we can just remember for a hot second that very few people purchase the on whatever first time they see something. Right. It takes multiple touches, multiple you know, listens. They talk with their friends. They talk with their colleagues, a trusted advisor. The more that we realize that all of these activities are important, it just – shifts the media mix or the levers in which you pull depending on what the product is product tool service that you have what your position is in the market you know what are the macroeconomic conditions and what is going on with your customer base and if you understand those things you can construct a go-to-market plan that takes into account all those variables and deliver something that a is within your budget and b achieves your business goals Hmm. okay so i have a i have a question that uh probably runs counter to all of the 
holistic wisdom you've shared about how to actually do this work, but um, <laughs> well, have to ask it anyways. So uh, setting aside everything you've shared about, you know, segmentation and being really thoughtful about how you reach people and when, um, if you just had to choose one content type, one distribution channel to get your brand story across uh, to the right customers, what would you choose? Um, you know, I, again, I, I just need to caveat the crap out of this by saying it is entirely dependent on the business that you're in and I all the things said I just you said. You can't say but, it depends, but I know, I know, I'm but if joking. I had, if, if I, if I was like held down and I had to answer, I would say Google, yeah. honestly, yeah. um, the internet nice. is how I put it. Like whatever <laughs> audience or technical decision maker, business decision maker, that's looking to make a purchase, they, they do so through a written word. And I feel right. like if it's searchable on the web and you know how like everybody's saying like chat GTP is potential to upend Google, like maybe, but it's still going to deliver you an answer. Either way, that answer is likely going to come in the form of a written word. It's not going to come in the form of a video or a TikTok. So I would just say like written word is still the strongest form of communication. Hands down. We can tell customer stories, quotes, testimonials, business value impact. We can do that with documentation, architectures, getting started materials. The written word is the most important thing. Content plus SEO is the foundation of every strategy that like I will ever give anybody. And I feel like if you do nothing else, write good content and make sure that it is optimized to be found on the web. Full stop. Nice. Amen. Good to bring it back to the fundamentals there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, that's great. Uh, bonus question for you. Um, I know we're, we're coming uh, up against the, the top of the hour here, but um, Web3, right? Everyone's talking about Web3. Um, is there a play that you think makes sense for you all? If so, what do you think that might be? Well, I, I'll turn it on ahead. I don't know whether or not it makes sense for Databricks, but I think in general, Web, I've, I've played a lot in Web3. When I was looking at jobs, um, I was at Microsoft, I was looking for what's next. Mm -hmm. I considered a whole bunch of Web3 plays. Mm -hmm. And Ultimately, I didn't choose a Web3 play, partly because I don't think the technology use case is there yet for it to make broader practical sense. But for Certainly. me, there's actually a combination of what's happening with generative AI and Web3 that I think has an opportunity. So if anybody, any entrepreneur out there is listening, you're welcome to take this idea. Just give me credit for it. Um, but I, I really do think whoever can figure out how to give credit to an artist or author of which, you know, some sort of chat GPT or AI then uses to train the model or to provide some sort of generative answer, I think that's going to be a really interesting economy because at the end of the day, the big struggle that I think artists and, and writers are having with ChatGPT and any other form of generative AI is that it's the Wild West. There's no way to give credit where credit was originally due. And I know someone's going to argue like all art is at some level – derivative of other art, but mm -hmm. there's a level of work that goes in from an artist's point of view to learn those skills and to make it their own craft and then deliver something that is new and generative to the world. I think the same can be true of this AI. If there is a proactive conversation, a productive conversation where I voluntarily give something into this economy and Web3 through a blockchain is able to know me and able to say this model took 10% of my idea and five and 10 and 20 and 30% of whatever somebody else's stuff, but I'm linked back to the creation of this thing. I actually think there's a huge market for that and people will pay in because they see this being a, a much broader application than some of the narrow focus of, of stable diffusion or, or chat GPT or mid journey or, you know, Dolly today. Yeah, yeah. It's like, if you could, especially if you could even, if you could incentivize being transparent about your, you know, image source or inspirations and in your prompts, like make that actually cool that yeah. like, Oh, I'm buying this art and there's transparency about what inputs went into that. Or I like how they combined these specific artists who I actually like. Right. And then those artists are benefiting that. And that actually makes it more marketable. I, I think so, especially when you consider the societal impact that that type of value positive generative AI would bring versus the the challenge of like, we love what 
ChatGPT is doing and, and Dolly and, and MidJourney are doing, but we don't know if we feel it still feels kosher inside. It's like, it's like icky a little bit. So like, I feel like <laughs> whoever can figure this out, like there is absolutely a space and a place for it. And, and Web3, this distributed web promise that this is offering, it absolutely has a solution. It just might not only be in finance. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. So free, free, uh, free business idea for anybody that's listening. Right? There you go. Good yeah. luck. And and just remember, <laughs> you heard it here first on this podcast. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Brian. Hey, thank you so much for being on. Um, it's been awesome catching up with you and, uh, just chatting with you. Um, next time when we do this, we're going to have to book like three hours just because, uh, it's, it's always a joy to catch up and hear what you have to say on any topic. Uh, if people want to learn more about you and follow you or connect with you online, uh, how can they best find you? Find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I would have said Twitter a hot minute ago, but I think mm -hmm. we all know what's going on there. So find me on LinkedIn. I have an open profile, Brian Saffler, Brian with a Y. Brian with a Y. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I post all my eccentric thoughts on that. So good luck on there. That's where <laughs> you can yeah. you can learn more about AI ethics. Yeah, yeah. There's there's always <laughs> yeah there's always a weird tangent I'll be taking on a Thursday. It's a slow Thursday, so I'll just say something weird. So here we go. Subscribe. Awesome. Column 5's Best Story Wins is for marketing and branding professionals looking to unlock their growth potential. Each episode features a conversation with industry leaders about how they win the hearts and minds of their customers and build world-class brands. You'll learn about their success stories and their failures, as well as ideas for how to take your own marketing efforts to the next level. Welcome to Best Story Wins.